Two programmes later this evening here on Radio 4. But now it's 7.35. The Making of M.A.S.H. John Williams reports from Hollywood on what makes the television series M.A.S.H. a smash. Okay, we got action. Yeah. Okay, any speed. Roll camera. Go ahead, take one. Give me just a second. All right. Okay. Action. Okay. Any more business? Any gripes? Yeah, I got a gripe. Sour gripes. I'm bored. Bored, 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 bored. Uh-oh. Man overboard. To illustrate the depths of my own despair, yesterday I came that close to begging Klinger for one brief glimpse of the photos of his cousin Hakeem's nuptials. Oh, will you clowns knock it off? This happens to be a staff meeting. Go ahead, Colonel. Say something. Thank you, Major. Cut. That's number one on the lens. One on the dolly. One on the dolly. One on the lens. This is Studio 9 at 20th Century Fox in Los Angeles, a huge wooden barn of a building which, for six months every year, becomes an American outpost in the Korean War. It's the scene of Mobile Army Surgical Hospital 4077, MASH, set out here on the studio floor, the canvas of the tents giving off a pervasive, musty smell under the hot lights. That scene they've just shot is one of 75 sequences which will make up another episode of MASH, one of the most successful series in television history. It's a phenomenon in American television, never out of the top ten programs, usually in the top three. They're just finishing here the eighth year of production, and shooting on a ninth starts in the autumn. It's a record equaled only by the Waltons and surpassed only by Hawaii Five-O. MASH also commands an extraordinary respect from television critics, because it stands out from the rest of formula television, from what one producer here calls the garbage of the jiggle shows. He means programs like Charlie's Angels, which is made just around the corner. So what's made MASH so successful? It's a comedy like many that works because everyone takes it so seriously, like the star, Alan Alder. This is a comedy that is uh, brave enough to recognize that people get hurt in a war and absorb that and spit it out again and, and, and base its comedy, base its comic vision on the idea that... Uh, that that brutality and that hurt is to be hated and in a situation where nothing can be done about it because there are people shooting at each other and if you try to stop them they'll both shoot at you the uh, the fact the ugly fact of being imprisoned in a madhouse like that instead of driving these characters crazy drives them funny Sponge. Some of the work we're doing on these kids' legs hasn't even hit the textbooks yet. Chalk it up to the insanity of war, Father. Enemy advances bring medical advances. If this war goes on long enough, we'll find a cure for everything. If there's anybody left to be cured. Progress. The Korean conflict, dedicated to better health through suffering. Bert Metcalf has been with MASH since the beginning, when the studio decided to capitalize on the success of Robert Altman's film. Now he's the executive producer, responsible for the $10 million a year budget it takes to shoot a season of 25 episodes, and for keeping the program artistically on the right lines. We're not doing um, a hi honey I'm home kind of harassed father or can I borrow the keys to the car dad or people in and out of closets type of comedy. It's not conventional sitcom we are lumped into that category because there doesn't seem to be any other place to put us but yet we're not like that we're, we're it's much blacker and it has it deals far more uh incisively with uh, social comment and so there's a there's an underlying s significance and solidity to the material to the premise of the show that that uh, you know, other shows just don't have. You just don't have that income. From the start eight years ago, they hit on the right formula. People were looking for something to identify with that was anti-war, anti-government, anti-establishment, um, uh, just uh, an avenue for the irreverence and... Um, uh, 
you know, kind of flouting of convention that this show represents. David Styers, who plays the pompous Major Winchester, is fairly new to British audiences because the series here is a couple of years behind the American run. But he's already a veteran. Why is he fascinated by it? Because I think it explores what it's talking about moment to moment instead of saying we, this week we're going to do an, an hysterically funny show uh, and the next week we're going to do a terribly serious one. Th the elements of, uh, of humor and uh, unhappiness are blent so well that it's like watching people's lives happen instead of people being pigeonholed or forced to behave certain ways. I get the feeling we're discovering these people's lives instead of being shown them. Does that, does that make sense? In many ways, MASH is an old-fashioned production. It relies on an old Hollywood device, putting a group of people together under stress. It's still shot with a single movie camera, whereas most Hollywood series now use three videotape cameras. But most of all, in a business where fantasy is now the keynote, it's based very firmly on fact. Over the eight years, we've contacted, and I've talked on the phone, and we've recorded the conversations, and then we'll transcribe the material into manuscript form. We've talked to a couple of hundred doctors who lived through all of that, and uh, it's an incredible experience. And it's interesting because you will call them up, and uh, all the doctors will quite often say, uh, look, um, I don't want to be rude here, but I'm a very busy man, and I can only give you about 10 minutes. And we'll say, fine, fine, whatever you can do. And then perhaps an hour or two later, you, there, you can't shut them up. I mean, it becomes therapeutic, and it just pours out, because for 25 years, they haven't thought much about it. They certainly haven't talked very much about it, because nobody particularly cares. And I'm, of course, a, a rapt audience. I mean, I, I hang on every word, because it becomes very rich material. Comedy is notoriously hard work. Each MASH episode is shot in a week, a day's rehearsal, three or four days shooting, almost all of it in the studio. Then some exterior scenes are shot at the Fox Ranch in Malibu Canyon. It's eight o'clock in the morning until seven at night, a gruelling schedule. Loretta Swit, the formidable Major Houlihan, has been doing it for eight years. It can catch up with you over the long pull. We have little one-week breaks every so often that we desperately need. We all really fold the day before one of those breaks is coming. We just are so bleary-eyed from, from work. And it seems like the weekends sort of uh, come and go before we... And actually, things pile up during the week that you weren't able to uh, accommodate that you must do on the weekends. So um, it's, it's very hard work, long hours and very hard work. Can you tell me what you're doing just to... This is a needlepoint pillow. It will be a pillow when it's stuffed up. I do it between shots or when they're lighting or when I'm not in a shot because it's, um, it's good for me on the set. I tell you, I find it very difficult to read because I'm the kind of actress who gets totally absorbed in the characters of the book and I start doing them. And it takes me right out of preparing for what I'm supposed to be doing next. Also, there's a, a quite a bit of noise and chaos here. It's, I lose my place a lot. And so I found that I didn't want to just sit around. This was the most productive and creative uh, way I could use the time. So I've done a lot of pillows over the years. Klinger, have you seen my wedding band? It was in the nurse's changing room, wrapped with a piece of tissue paper. White tissue paper? Yes. Sitting on a shelf next to a coffee cup? Yes, yes, that's it. You found it. Oh, thank God. Oh, bless you, Klinger. I, uh, I sort of threw it away. Throw it away! Oh, yes, yes, yes. We'll go through the garbage. We'll find it. Because the cast have worked together for so long, they have an easy rapport and few problems of temperament, largely because, as David Styers puts it, their characters are continuously explored. There have been a number of shows in which I've turned out to be a good guy by, by helping get something done, achieving something just short of miraculous in, in surgery, helped people out without their knowing. But for the most part, I'm the, the, the character is the brunt of a number of jokes, and, and as it should be. Although we play the same roles week to week, there's a little piece of print on the bulletin board over there that expresses it too. We seem to be a little repertory company, that because the full character is explored, we are not used as stereotypes. Um, you see facets, uh, uh, the, 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 the character is differentiated from week to week depending on, on the situation. Alan Alder, as Hawkeye Pierce, is undoubtedly the star. But the second lead, Mike Farrell, now in his fifth year, doesn't feel that he's overshadowed. Well, uh, 
one of the great things about Alan is that he is not always so much more prominent. He is, he is uh, so willing to share in the attention, in the focus of the show, that I think that has been probably the single most uh, powerful force in making the show what it is, and that is that everyone in the show has a, a clearly definable, understandable character with whom the audience makes a connection. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people out in the country who's who dictate, who indicate favorites in the show, and they're not always Hawkeye. You know, Radar's a favorite, Klinger's a favorite, or Colonel Potter's a favorite. And it's because Alan has laid back and understood, uh, one, the, uh, the value of allowing himself as the main character to be surrounded and supported by humans, three-dimensional characters, rather than the cardboard kind of characters you find in television sometimes. And that speaks, I think, to his intelligence. It also speaks to his sensitivity and his all-round good nature. He's just a terrific man, uh, a remarkable talent, and, uh, and uh, I've never worked with anyone quite like him. It was never meant to be the Alan Alder show, and Alder himself is the first to point that out. What's made it a success is what Bert Metcalf calls the chemistry of ensemble playing. In many cases, the producer and the star will be mortal enemies. They are thrust into a basically adversarial position. That isn't true here, and that was, a, of course, of great benefit to me in this being the first show I had ever produced, to, to inherit an environment in which everybody was uh, ethical and kind of um, steeped in an in a, in a artistic integrity, you know, wanting to do good work. There wasn't this um, barracuda-ish uh, inclination on anybody's part, on, on Alan's or on any of the other people, to, to kind of, um, I'm going to make my mark and just trample everybody else. There was none of the star of a show saying, don't give that person too much to do because they're kind of uh, shining, you know, they're doing too well. Why don't I keep on driving? Well, you know, Major, you have a very natural beauty. Why hide it with a lot of jewelry? Look, I went through every garbage bin in Korea. I even dove into a pile of burning rubbish because I saw something shiny. It was only a lousy gold watch. Please, get a rifle. Shoot me. Put me out of your misery. Oh, no, you're not going to get off that easy. From now on, I'm going to make your life so rotten you wish you were in combat. Major, I'm tired, I'm dirty, and I burn my nose. On top of that, I'm due on KP in five minutes, and I won't have a chance to shower. How are you going to make my life any more rottener? I, I think my agent said this to me one time, and she said, you know, it's strange, but you are the comedy relief on a comedy show. And uh, it, it, it's very difficult doing those kind of things, particularly in scenes where you've come from where there's been a great deal of tragedy, uh, uh, soldiers who are wounded, the operating scenes, and then they have to come in and do something silly following that. But that's what makes the show so wonderful, because of the balance. Uh, I, I would like to do a few dramatic things in the show. That, that seems to be the thing that uh, people uh, feel makes you a better actor. Or they'll take note of you when they say, gee, did you see that scene? That person cried, or he had this wonderful uh, screaming scene. In essence, though, I think comedy is far more difficult than, than drama. It's a lot easier to make somebody cry than it is to make somebody laugh. Klinger, the phony transvestite, has been in the series since the start. So has Father Mulcahy, played by William Christopher, who shows a true philosophical disregard for the dangers of being typecast. An actor has enough to worry about. My goodness, we all have enough to worry about in life in general. To uh, being typecast is a, it doesn't, it, it doesn't worry me. I suppose if many people, a lot of people came to me and started to say, well, you know, you're not going to work because of having played Father Mulcahy, you're, you're going to be stuck until you another priest role comes along, maybe I'd start worrying about it. But I don't get that kind of comment, you know. People, most people I talk to say, well, when MASH ends, you know, maybe there'll be some sort of spin-off or keep doing the same character in another series, or uh, maybe there'll be uh, totally something totally different, but the chances of continuing work are, be, are greatly enhanced by having become as familiar to the public, being on a show that's this popular and working weekly. As we know, we're seen by a huge number of people, of course. And uh, that, uh, that's very heartening for an actor. In the six months a year layoff period, which the studio calls hiatus time, most of the cast seem to be as busy as they are during MASH. 
Alder, for example, writes, directs and appears in films. One opened here a short time ago called The Seduction of Joe Tynan, which he made last year. TV movies are another source of employment. But sometimes the leading characters use the series as a springboard and leave altogether, which, according to Alder, isn't the problem it seems. The, the cast is, has gone through a, uh, many changes. Um, but every time that's happened, although we were losing somebody who was um, highly skilled and, and whom the audience had grown to love, uh, it was always an opportunity for us to find new directions to go in and shake up all of the character relationships on the show so that when we would bring in a new, strong, interesting character played by a new and interesting actor, uh, everybody in the company, all the, all the other characters would begin to relate not only to that character a little differently, but to each other a little differently. And, uh, and it would just give us, it would always give us uh, many more stories. David Stiers was a new boy, replacing the butt of everyone's jokes, Major Frank Burns. Jesus, they could have had me for lunch when I showed up. I was so nervous. Uh, they let me alone for about three weeks. It was all very supportive. There was a gentleness and a concern, and uh, th they worked to integrate me as quickly as possible. And as soon as I began to get secured, then the practical joke started, and that kind of camaraderie that, that, that establishes itself over any long run. There is a feeling of genuine friendliness, and rehearsals like this one often end in an explosion of laughter. Hey, you guys probably don't know this, but I'm working on a humor and uniform column for uh, Reader's Digest. See these two doctors get off the streetcar. I heard it, Pierce. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that works, that works better than uh, yeah, absolutely. what we originally thought. That's right. Well, that's easy. Carry the the irascible Colonel Potter, played there by Harry Morgan, doesn't only take part in episodes. Like Alder, he also directs them, as he was doing that day. I started to direct uh, on a show that Dick Boone had called the Dick Boone Repertory or whatever, I guess uh, about 12, 13 years ago. But it's kind of a hobby more than a profession. I do one once in a while, you know. I'd hate to have had to make a living off of my uh, directing earnings. It's kind of hard to... You've either got to do one or the other, I think, very, very few guys. You know, if you want to direct, you've got to concentrate on that. But how difficult is it to actually appear in it and direct it at the same time? Well, I can see uh, some circumstances where it would be very difficult, and I, I don't think anybody should do it, but here, where it's, uh, the whole thing is sort of a team effort anyway, it's a cinch. Alder plays an even greater role, not only actor and director, but also creative consultant. He's worth to the studio every penny of the £150,000 he gets for the six months of MASH. Over the years, Alder has changed the direction of the programme significantly. He's a fervent advocate of women's rights, and it's through him that Loretta Switt's part has changed. She's no longer called Hot Lips, for instance. Uh, I think she's changed tremendously. When uh, we began, she was really ultra-military and uh, very limited in her uh, way of thinking. She was very straight-laced and by the book, Iron Majorette. And um, over the years, she's become considerably more humanized. And she's um, a sensuous woman. And uh, I think that has also developed over the years where she uh, now is looking for something uh, more real and more permanent than her silly affairs with Frank Burns or that genre. So she's changed a great deal. Scissors. Scissors. You know, Klinger found my ring. I told you to have fake, Margaret. You didn't believe me, but I knew it would show up, you see? It's not the original. Oh, really? No, it's a cheap copy, and I like it a lot better. Thank you. Anytime. Forceps. Alder's role, on the other hand, hasn't changed a great deal. And successful though it is, he doesn't really like talking about it. You know, I'm not too good talking about Hawkeye. I, uh, the, the character is, is uh, quite different from me, and yet I use myself as much as I can. He's um, more of a smart aleck than I am on most occasions. Um, but, and he's also a, a, a womanizer, which I'm not, and he drinks more than I do. Uh, although he loves his work the way I love mine, and he's 
dedicated the way I am. I, I mean, we probably keep the same hours. But uh, there's a, there's a, he expresses his cynicism perhaps more uh, readily than I do. In Hollywood terms, working on M.A.S.H. is considered something out of the ordinary. It adds to an actor's reputation. The production staff at M.A.S.H. and the actors talk a good deal about integrity and keeping up standards. It's easy to dismiss all this as mere Hollywood sententiousness, but there is something special about M.A.S.H., something Bert Metcalf calls peer group acceptance. People who work in television and make a good living at it are notorious in that they rarely watch it. They have no great pride in what they do. If you go to a, a gathering of people of an evening who, who are employed in television and you ask somebody, uh, particularly in the, in the kind of like the writer, director, producer area, and he says, well, I produce, I don't want to mention any shows, but if we're talking about really sort of routine journeyman, run-of-the-mill junk of which you know there is a, a good deal, um, there's no sense of pride in that admission. He's not going to say, I produce whatever and, and expect you to st stand there and say, you do, really? Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's always as if it's kind of just sort of uttered under one's breath and everybody else says, oh, oh well, that's nice. And then you go on and talk about something else. But this show, invariably, the conversation stops and people will say in, in this sort of peer group area, people who make a point of saying, I never watch television. I really avoid it. I shun it. But I make a point to watch your show. Everyone loves MASH, and especially 20th Century Fox, because it makes them enormous amounts of money. Just before the buzzer went for a take, Richard Harper, the vice president in charge of Cation, explained how much. Anytime you have a show in this country that goes more than three years on the network, it's a success, and then you can syndicate it in the, in, in the United... The, the syndication, the U, this U.S. market syndication alone is worth multi-million dollars. Our, our licensing on MASH alone in this country is somewhere in the area of 40 to 50 million dollars for reruns. So it's a very profitable business? Oh, if you have a success. If you do one year, like unfortunately happened with Paper Chase, you don't have enough episodes to go back into rerun syndication. And so it's finished. That's the end of it. And the American market is only a small part of the deal, for MASH is now sold in 60 countries. I think the only market, worthwhile market, and it's not a big market, it's the show is not saleable in South Korea. In some of those countries, like Mexico, local scriptwriters are used in the dubbing to make the jokes understandable in Spanish. But the studio emphasised that the changes that they make are very small. And also on dubbing day comes a man with a black box who adds studio laughter from chuckles to belly laughs. The CBS network, which screens MASH in America, insists on laughter. The producers concede rather unwillingly. And they're rather pleased that here on BBC Two we get the original version without the fake audiences. But the very success of MASH has brought its own problems. If you're in the eighth season of a show, then the stories get very hard to come by because uh, you've done so much, uh, you know, and you, you don't want to keep repeating yourself, and you have to keep digging and finding new ways and different ways to, to say a lot of the same things. Uh, so that's why the characters keep getting richer, and uh, uh, you explore them a great deal, because there's only so many times you can say war is hell and the food is rotten and all of that, so you have to explore other areas of, of uh, the human condition. The big question is, of course, how long can MASH go on? Mike Farrell takes a pragmatic view. I personally feel that it, if it doesn't end this year, it'll end next year, and the reason for that is that it's a, uh, it goes back to that commitment we have to the quality of the show. We don't want it to whimper away, you know, sort of be bled dry. We want to go out just as strong as we came in. The last word lies with Alder, because it's tacitly admitted that if he goes, there's little left. I, I don't know how much longer it can last. It, uh, it's something that we take a year at a time. But we have to decide at the end of the ninth year if we think we have enough stories to go on to a tenth year. A tenth year! <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs>